All right. Uh, so it is Christmas Sunday. Uh, you know, you guys know if you've been here, we've been going through the book of Mark. And I would have liked to continue in the book of Mark and tie it to Christmas. But I couldn't do it. So, <laughs> so we're going to look at uh, one of the most famous passages about Christmas, about the birth of Jesus Christ, the most famous prophecy. Uh, and it comes from Isaiah chapter 9, verse, verses 6 to 7. Okay, and uh, so turn there, open your Bibles if you have them, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7. If you don't have your Bibles, you can look in your bulletins, and it will also show up on the screen if you don't have a bulletin, okay? But Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7 says this. This is the word of the Lord. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me uh, pray for us. Father, we thank you so, so, so much for your goodness demonstrated to us in sending your son Jesus to come to this earth, to dwell amongst men, to put on flesh, to live the life that we should have lived, to die the death that we deserved so that we could have life and forgiveness in you through your resurrection. Lord, we thank you. We know that apart from you, there is no hope. There is no peace. There's no real joy. But in you, we find all of those things. And so, Lord, we thank you. We worship you. We praise you. We pray, Lord, that you'd speak into our lives now through your holy word. Give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see. Give us faith to believe in the power of your word to give us life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So most of us probably know this passage quite well. Uh, if you have been attending church, if you have listened to Christmas messages, you've probably heard this passage. Uh, you've probably heard, heard this passage sung as well, famously, Handel's Messiah. You guys know, for unto us a child is born, right? You guys know it. Like, everybody knows this passage quite well. But perhaps, maybe, what a lot of us don't know so well is the context that this prophecy was actually given in. Let me explain to you guys, okay? I'm going to give you a little bit of context of this passage. About 700 years before this child that was prophesied, that's Jesus, before he was born, there was this growing power in the area of Palestine called the Assyrian Empire. And this growing power pretty much was making everybody in the neighborhood worried. And so what happened was uh, the kings in the area of Palestine, particularly the king of Aram and the king of Israel, that's the northern kingdom of Israel, they decided to make this alliance in order to protect themselves against this growing power, right? And so that's what they want to do. Now, in an effort to make this alliance even stronger, they decide, let's ask the king of Judah to join this alliance. Okay? That's the southern kingdom of Israel. Let's ask him as well to join this alliance so that we can protect ourselves against the Assyrian Empire. Now, what happens is King Ahaz, he was the king of Judah. He actually says no. Okay? He doesn't want to join this alliance. And so what ends up happening is these kings, they start to pressure King Ahaz pretty much by marching their armies up to Jerusalem's gates. Pretty much saying, join us or die. And so you can imagine King Ahaz is pretty nervous about this. And ultimately what happens, he gets so worried that he starts thinking about, man, should I just join this alliance to protect my kingdom? Or, or maybe I should just join the Assyrian Empire. Maybe I should just form an alliance with those guys. Because as the saying, go, the saying goes, if you can't beat them, join them, right? And so that's pretty much what King Ahaz is thinking. Now, it is in this context this situation where there is armies threatening from both sides that God sends the prophet Isaiah to King Ahaz and pretty much says, don't worry. Don't be afraid. 
Don't put your trust in a political and military alliance. Trust in God. Now, don't you guys love to hear that message when you're going through a tough time? Like, you know, your finances are really bad and someone just says, trust in God. Right? We all love to hear this, right? <laughs> you're laughing because we don't like to hear this. Even though we know, yeah, of course we should trust God. We don't want to hear this, right? We want to take action for ourselves. And it's the same thing with King Ahaz because uh, Isaiah actually says, ask God for a sign. He'll give you a sign that this is true. And Ahaz is like, no, 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 no. I don't want a sign. Because really, he doesn't want to obey God, right? He doesn't want to have to trust in God. So he says, no, don't give me a sign. But God's like, I'm going to give you a sign anyway. Because this is happening. Whether you like it or not, this is happening. And so in Isaiah chapter 7, God says, through Isaiah, he says, chapter 7, verse 14, very famous, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And then a little bit later in our passage today, in chapter 9, God gives just astounding, incredible description about this child. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Names that pretty much suggest this king or this child is going to be divine. He's not going to just be an ordinary child. He's going to be divine. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I find all of this, knowing the context, knowing about this prophecy, I find all of this to be very amazing, but also a little bit confusing. <laughs> and honestly, maybe even a little bit frustrating, <laughs> to be honest. Now, what's amazing about this is that some seven centuries later, okay, that's 700 or so years Later, this prophecy is fulfilled by Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ. It's amazing. And not just this one. Evidently, there are over 300 prophecies in the Bible fulfilled by Jesus. 300, over 300. That is amazing. Now, there's uh, some mathematicians who uh, calculated the odds of this happening. Maybe some of you guys have heard this before. But there's a mathematician who said that the odds of one person, one person fulfilling even just eight prophecies, okay, eight. You know, you know what the odds are? One in a hundred quadrillion. <laughs> some of you are like, I didn't even know that number existed, <laughs> right? It's like million, billion, trillion, and then quadrillion. Yeah, that. It's basically one with 17 zeros behind it. Yeah, that's just to fulfill eight prophecies, guys. For Jesus to fulfill over 300 prophecies is impossible, pretty much. Impossible. Unless, of course, you're God. Unless, of course, you are the son of God. That is amazing. So amazing. But here's what's confusing about this. And again, maybe even a little bit frustrating about this. The fact that this prophecy given to King Ahaz 700 years before Jesus was born was fulfilled 700 years later. Because think about this, guys. Remember the context of what's going on here when, Isaiah, or when Ahaz is receiving this prophecy. His kingdom is facing a horrible Immediate danger, is it not? He's got armies marching towards Jerusalem, threatening him to kill him. And he's probably thinking, what, what, what's this all about? How is this birth of a child going to help me in this present situation? Like, of course, he doesn't know that this child is going to be born 700 years later. But seriously, if I'm Ahaz, I'm thinking, how is the birth of a child going to help this situation right now? I might even be dead before this child grows up which actually he will be. <laughs> How? Now, it's, it's confusing and a little bit frustrating, and perhaps there are many of us in this room right now that are asking that same question today. How is the birth of a child going to fix my problem right now? I've got a pretty urgent situation right now. How is it going to help? Maybe you're confused. Maybe you are frustrated because you're experiencing a difficulty right now. And you're wondering, what is, what is, how does Christmas help me with this? I personally know a lot of people. 
A lot of people who are going through difficulties, even, even family members to me who are going through difficulties during this Christmas season, and they might be asking this question, just like King Ahaz might have been asking this question. Now, if that's you, if there are some of you here right now that you're asking this question, the first thing that I want to say to you, the first thing that you need to know is that God absolutely cares about what you're going through. He absolutely cares about what you're going through. Now, I may not know why you're going through what you're doing. You, going through. you may not know why you're going through what you're going through, but I assure you, God knows. God understands. And not only that, God absolutely cares about what you're going through. The Bible tells us that we can cast all of our anxieties upon the Lord. All of them. It doesn't just say some of them. It doesn't say just the important things, just only the serious things. All of them. No matter what you're going through, big or small, whatever situation in life you may be in, whatever trouble, you can cast it upon the Lord. Why? Because he cares for you. That's what the word of God says. Now, if that's still kind of hard for you to believe, some of you guys are like, does he really care for me? I don't know. It just seems so difficult. Ultimately, how we really see and how we really know that he really cares deeply for us is Christmas. He came. He came for you. He came for me. He came for all of us. And not to destroy us. Though he could have. He could have came on a mission to destroy evil, all of us. But he came to rescue us. Rescue us by dying on the cross to save us from all of our sins. He absolutely cares. Now the second thing that you need to know is that, and this one's a little bit harder. Even though all of us, like Ahaz, we would love to have our immediate and temporary problem solved. Wouldn't we? Like, wouldn't we all just love to have all of our difficulties like poof, gone right now? We would all love this, of course. But the truth is, that's not what Christmas was about. That's not why Jesus first came. It's not. It's not why Jesus was born in the first place. The reason Jesus came was not to solve our immediate and temporary problems, but it was to solve our more permanent and eternal problems. The problem that really is at the root of all problems. Everything, every problem or trial that we, are go we go through in this life, it can pretty much all be traced back to this problem. And that problem is sin. Sin which separates us from the God who created and loved us. Sin that separates us from the God who's the source of all life, the Bible tells us. The source of everything good, everything right, everything true, everything beautiful, everything perfect. Sin separates us from this God. That is really the root of all the pain, all the suffering, all the problems that we experience in this life. It's our sin and our rebellion against the creator and his ways, which are perfect. This is mankind's biggest and most devastating problem. And so for King Ahaz, his biggest problem was not the surrounding kingdoms that were threatening to destroy him physically. They weren't. It was sin which would destroy him spiritually and separate him from a relationship with God permanently. And it's the same thing for every single one of us. That was our biggest problem. Our biggest problem is not, hear me on this, it is not our trouble with our finances. It is not our trouble in our relationships. It is not our trouble in our health. Not that those things are not important. He's going to take care of those things as well. But Christmas was about Jesus coming to solve our biggest problem problem and thank god thank god that that's what christmas was about because if christmas was just about jesus coming to solve our immediate problems whatever crisis that you may be facing right now well then at best 
Think about what your best life could look like. Think about, uh, you know, the most comfortable life you could have on earth. Just think about it. I mean, maybe you graduate from a wonderful college, top college, and then you can get a top job making a lot of money. And you buy a nice house for yourself, right? Very, very comfortable house. Buy pretty much any material possession that you want. Hopefully get married, okay? Hopefully, <laughs> let's say you get married to the spouse of your dreams and, uh, you know, she's perfect or he's perfect. You get, you get along so well and then you have perfect children, never cry through the night, you know, always obeying their parents. They're just perfect children, like so comfortable. Everything's good. And then you, you make money so you can go on vacations together. You can enjoy good food together. You can see the world. And then your kids grow up and they marry the perfect spouse. And then they have perfect children. And then you're old and you've done so much only to die. So sad, right? But, but really, right? Only to die and then face an eternal separation of pain and suffering apart from God. If Jesus did not come to save us, that's the best that any single one of us could have had. Right? Whatever you can imagine in your head, like the best life right now, that's it. And then the worst is yet to come. Right? And so thank God. Thank God that, that he promises Ahaz and us a Messiah who's going to be born to us. He's going to be given to us. Who's going to save us from the real problem of sin so that we can have peace with God. Peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what Romans 5.1 tells us. I love this verse. You should memorize this verse. It is a glorious verse. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. You know what that means? That word justified, it pretty much means you've been made right before God. You are no longer guilty for your sins. That's what justified means. You're right before God. You're blameless. You are not guilty anymore before God. How? By faith in Jesus Christ. Because of all this, it goes on to say, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. Amen. That's who he is. He's the Prince of Peace. He gives us peace with God. In other words, you are no longer separated from this God. No more. That sin that was separating you from God, no more. And Romans 8, you know, Romans 8, wonderful chapter. If you've never read it, please go read Romans chapter 8. It goes on to say that nothing, everyone say nothing. nothing. Say it again, nothing. nothing. Absolutely nothing can separate you from the love of God. Some of you know this song, nothing, nothing, absolutely. You guys know that song? It's a, it's a kid's song. Deep theology in that kid's song, man, I'm telling you. Like, learn that song. It's a wonderful song. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Sometimes this is difficult to believe, right? Sometimes it is very difficult to believe this because we keep sinning. Anybody sin like this week? Come on, dude, seriously. Really? Anybody sin this week? Anybody? <laughs> really? You guys are holy, man. Wow. I need to hang out with you guys. Right? But we sin. Maybe you're just too guilty. Hey, guys, nothing can separate you from the love of God, okay? You can raise your hands. Yeah, I'm a sinner, but saved by grace. It's okay. But we keep sinning. We keep messing up. And I don't know about you guys, but I've made some serious promises to the Lord. Lord, I will never do that again. You ever, you ever done that, God? I won't do that again. I promise you. And then I mess up again. You guys experienced that before? Man, when you experience that, you feel like crap. You honestly do. You're like, how could God love me? I, I, I was like earnestly saying, I promise I'll never do this again, and then I messed up. How could God love me? How could he really love me? But you know what God's saying? Nothing, nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing, 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 absolutely nothing. What can take your love away? Right? Seriously. Nothing. It's true. It's true. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. You know why? You know why? Well, it's because you're good people. <laughs> it's because we all deserve a second chance. It's because we should all be trusted to do better next time. God can trust us, right? He can trust us to do better next time. No, that's not why. Thank God it's not why. Otherwise, he would have left us a long time ago. 
It's because of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, you know where Jesus Christ is right now? He's in our hearts. That's definitely sure. He's with us. But you know where else? He's at the right hand of the Father. At the right hand of God Almighty. He's right there. And you know what he's doing? Does anybody know what he's doing? You should know what he's doing. This is so encouraging. Somebody say it. He's interceding for us. He's praying for you. I want you to think about that time that you messed up this week. Some of you, it was like this morning on your way to church. You got angry at somebody. Some of you, it's like right now. Like, when's the sermon going to be finished? I need to go. Some of you got, just, just think about it. I mean, honestly, I hope that's not you. But just think about that, la- that time you sinned. Seriously, think about it this week. Just think about that time you sinned against God this week. You know what? You deserve to be punished and separated from God because of that sin. You deserved. I deserved it. But you weren't. You're not. You know why? Because Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. And when you committed that sin, you know what Jesus did? He said, Father, peace. I paid for that sin with my blood. I covered it completely with my blood. Charged that sin to my account. And that, that account is limitless, brothers and sisters, because the blood of Christ is enough to cover all of your sins. He's praying to the Father, Father, that one's mine. He belongs to me. She belongs to me. Forgive him. Forgive her. And the Father, every single time, done. Paid in full. Case closed. It is enough Now and forevermore, because again, the blood of Jesus is enough to cover over every single one of your sins. Not just some, every one of them. Past, present, future, all of them wiped away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Through faith, because he is the prince of peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, if that's what Christmas is all about, Christ the Savior came to save us from sin so that we could have peace with God even right now. If that's what Christmas is about, well, then let's ask the question again. How does this help us in our current struggle? How does Christmas help us with our immediate problems that we're facing right now? How? Here's how. Peace with God guarantees you ultimate peace. I'll say that again. Peace with God guarantees you ultimate peace. And that gives you the strength to endure, to carry on, to persevere. Now, now here's what I mean. If you have peace with God, if you have this, then you can be 100 percent sure that no matter what difficulty you go through in this life, it will not compare to the glory, the magnificence, the awesomeness that awaits you when you are with God forever. Will not compare. Now, I'm not trying to diminish our suffering. I'm not trying to belittle like what you're going through or the the hard times that we go through. I'm not trying to do that. But what I'm saying is that if we have peace with God, we can be totally confident that we will be with him. And that when we are with him, whatever struggles or trials that you have experienced in this life will seem like nothing. Because the glory of God is that much greater. Let me just give you a, a sports analogy. So how many of you guys like sports? Sports. Sports. What's sports? <laughs> Not a lot of sports fans, really? Any, anybody follow sports or like watch sports? Any kind of sport. Okay, let's say you guys watch sports. Let's say whatever team that you are following really sucks. Maybe you're from Cleveland. and uh, <laughs> I love you, Mike. But let's just say, whatever, your team is terrible. And, and in fact, they're just getting blown out like every single game, and it's like painful to watch. You ever experienced that? Where it's like painful to watch your team, it like really hurts? 
No, that, that was me for the past five years as a Laker fan, okay? It was painful to watch. <laughs> Better now, but it's just painful to watch. But imagine, imagine if you knew without a shadow of a doubt that your team was going to make this amazing comeback at the end of the season, and they're actually going to win the championship. Imagine if you knew this, right? Put it in your mind. Think about your team right now. That really sucks, but you know somehow they're going to win the championship. Somehow all of those struggles, the suffering, the trials, somehow it's way more bearable now, isn't it? Somehow it's like, oh, this is nothing. Like, they suck right now, but because you know that glory awaits, it's bearable. And when you actually experience that glory, that the championship, your team has won the championships, I mean, all of the past struggles, all of the past failures, all the past frustrations, throwing stuff at the TV, you know, all that that you go through, it, it, it's like nothing. It's like you're not even thinking about it anymore. It's like it was like so small because the joy of being champions far outweighs all of that. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you the truth. Jesus Christ has won the championship. Let's try that again. Jesus Christ has won the championship. Like, game over. It's, it's game over. It's finished. It's already done. It, it may not look this, that way right now. Yes, I know. We see this world is still broken. We see struggles. We, we go through difficult times. But the truth is the game's over. Jesus has won. And every single one of us Believers or not non-believers, every single person is going to witness this when Jesus returns at the end. You're going to witness this. And, and when he comes back, when he comes back the second time, it's not going to be like the first time. He's not going to come as a little humble baby at Christmas. Oh, come let us adore him. Let's let, you know, the magi and the shepherd. It's not going to be like that. He's going to come back as a mighty warrior, the Bible says riding on a war horse, fire blazing from his eyes, sword coming out of his mouth, tattoo like on his thigh, armies of angels following him, ready to wage war on evil. He's going to destroy evil for good. He's going to end all oppression, all suffering, all injustice. He will rid it all, all the evil. That's what he's going to do. That's the second advent when he comes again. Now, some of you guys are asking the question like, man, why didn't he just do that the first time? That would have been pretty awesome. Just come, pfft, wipe out all evil. Really? You wouldn't be here. <laughs> I wouldn't be here if that was the first time. We would all be gone. Because, again, we're sinners. We've got this problem of sin that he had to solve first. So the first time Jesus came, it was to deliver us from our sins. But the second time he comes, he's going to deliver us from suffering, all suffering. He's going to make all things right, all things. He's going to restore everything to the way, back to the way that it was meant to be. You know what that means? That means no more war, no more violence, no more hatred, no more racism. No more poverty, no more injustice, no more oppression, no more corrupt governments, no more corrupt businesses, no more broken families, no more divorce, no more damaged relationships, no more health problems, no more cancer, no more diabetes, no more allergies, no more flu, uh, no more air pollution. Can I get an amen? amen? Yeah, right? No more of that. He's going to make all things new. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more pain. No more death because there will be no more sin. No more. And he's going to dwell with us, the Bible says. He will dwell with us. And he will rule over us as our king with righteousness, with justice forevermore. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there's going to be no end, no end, forever and ever and ever. This is what peace with God guarantees. Through faith in the Prince of Peace. That's what it guarantees. Ultimate peace is coming. 
And when you know that, when you truly believe that, when you cling to that, it gives you the strength to endure and persevere no matter what you're going through. Now, that's not to say that we're just left hanging here on earth. Like, the Prince of Peace is like, well, I did my job, <laughs> set you free from sin, you're on your own now. You just go ahead and suffer and, and just suck it up because glory is coming later. That's not to say that that's just it. No. It's not just a future peace that we get. It's a present peace, even right now, even in the midst of suffering. Jesus tells us in uh, John chapter 14, 27, he says this to his disciples. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. You see, Jesus, he gives us peace now. Right now, you can have peace. And he says that his peace is different than what the world gives. You know, the, the type of peace that the world gives is very situational. It's very uh, conditional. It, it's a peace that you can only get as long as X, 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 right? As long as everything is going well, well, then you can have peace. As long as you have money in your bank, right, continually flowing, well, you can have peace. You can have security. As long as your job is not, not at risk, then you can have peace. As long as you get married to a great spouse, well, then you can have peace. It's situational. It's conditional. And if you don't have those things, well, then you don't have peace because the world cannot give you real, lasting peace. But the Prince of Peace can because the type of peace that Jesus gives is a peace that remains no matter what the situation is, no matter what. Even if there's no money in the bank and you're really struggling, even if your job security is at risk, even if there's, there's conflict in your neighborhood, you have conflicts with people, even if you're afflicted to the point of death and, and it feels impossible to feel peace, even then, in the midst of it all, the peace that Christ gives you allows you to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. And that's been the testimony of so many millions upon millions of believers who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, who've gone through some horrible things, who've been martyred for the faith, who've suffered tragedies. That's been the testimony of the church. It is well with my soul, no matter what. Because he gives peace. He's the prince of peace that gives a real peace. Peace. How? Why? I mean, how are we able to say this? How, how, how is the church people be, that have gone before us, how are they able to say, it is well with my soul? The answer is, he's with you. The Prince of Peace is with you. Right now. Right now. He's with you. And not only that, he is so incredibly close. You know how close he is? Some of you think, like, you know, the person next to me is pretty close. Like, I hope they can move away. He's closer than that. He lives inside of you. Is, can you get any closer than that? Like, can you get any closer than, like, living inside of you? You can't. He's that close. Living inside of you. And in every trial, every situation, every struggle, he never leaves you. He will never abandon you. He promises that. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, no matter what. And, and when you call on him, if you're going through a hard time, if you call on him when you are in trouble, he may not take you out of it. I know that's what we all want, right? I know we just wish, God, just save me from this. A lot of times it doesn't happen that way. We know this. Okay, let's just be real. He may not take you out of it, but he'll help you get through it. He'll help you. And you know how I know that? Because the word of God says that. He promises that he will always help you because he's the God who is an ever-present help in times of trouble. That's who he is, an ever-present help in times of trouble. When you're in trouble, he helps you. If you call on him, he promises that. Call on him. 
Not only will he always help you, he will always comfort you. Always. You know how I know that? Once again, the word of God tells us this. He's the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions. Again, I love that. All of our afflictions, he will comfort you. He will. And not only that, but he will embrace you with his presence. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, the sweet embrace of the presence of God. I I experienced this this morning just driving to church, and I was just worshiping. Actually, I was worshiping to Come Let Us Adore Him, that song. And I just felt like God was just in the car with me. (laughs) As I was saying, come let us adore him. I was just so overwhelmed that he would come for me. A sinner like me, you know, like, I'm so messed up. But he would come for me. And I just, that sweet presence of the Lord. If you've never experienced that, call on him. Worship him. Come to him. Because the Bible tells us he is near to the brokenhearted. He's near. If you've got troubles, if you've got afflictions, if you're going through a difficult time, he wants to be near you. He does. He will be your peace. He will be your peace. Because that's who he is. He's the prince of peace. Not just in the future, although that's the ultimate peace, but even now, right now. And if ever you doubt this, if ever you are just feeling like God has abandoned me, some of you maybe here right now, you're feeling that God, he's abandoned me. He has forsaken me. I know he's promises, but he's done it. I, I just don't feel his presence. If ever you think that, think about this. Think about this. If the Prince of Peace was willing to come at Christmas to rescue you, not to destroy you, but to rescue you by dying the death that you should have died, if he was willing to do that, to pay this enormous cost to save you, if he did not abandon us in our time of greatest need, Do you really think that he would ever abandon you in any need? Do you really think that? He didn't abandon us when we needed him the most. Do you really think he'll abandon you in any other situation? Of course not. He won't. He never will. The Prince of Peace loves you more than you can possibly imagine. The Prince of Peace cares for you. He does. He came for us. The Prince of Peace is with you right now. I want us to bow our heads uh, for a word of prayer. And I invite us right now to come and adore your Prince of Peace. Come and adore your King who came to save you, the King who came to give you peace that none of us deserve. Hope, everlasting hope that we shouldn't have. Joy, unspeakable joy. The power of the Spirit that lives in us. Just take some time to give thanks, to worship, to praise and adore your King. Let's start there. For those of you who are going through a storm right now, going through trials this Christmas, and even though you know, like, yeah, we should be joyful, we should be hopeful, we should be merry at Christmas because Christ came for us, but, but the reality is it's difficult. Then I urge you now to trust in the Prince of Peace, to call out to him and to believe that when he says that he will come to you, that he will comfort you, that he will embrace you, that he'll help you get through whatever you are going through, that he really will. 
Because again, he did not abandon us when we needed him the most. He will not abandon you. He never will. Not right now. And so I just urge you right now to call out to him. Some of you, maybe all you need to do is just to cry before the Lord because you're hurting. And, and that's okay. He'll comfort you. He'll weep with you. He's the God who weeps with those who weep. So let's just spend some time in the presence of the Lord who's here, who's with us. God Almighty, just think about that. He's here right now. Just spend some time responding to this God, whether it's thanksgiving, whether it's cries for help, whether it's confession, whatever it may be. Just spend some time in the presence of the Lord. Father, we give you praise. We glorify your name. We thank you for the peace, the everlasting peace that we have now and forevermore because of your son Jesus, the prince of peace who came for us who died for us, who shed his blood for us, who resurrected from the grave to conquer sin and death. We give you thanks and praise. And we thank you, Lord, that this song is true, that we will praise your name forever because of the increase of your government and of peace. There will be no end. Your kingdom will endure forever. You are the champion. The game is over. You've won, Jesus. And so we thank you that we have a glorious inheritance in you, that we will praise your name forever with all of the saints, with all of the angels around the throne, with all creation as you make all things new. We praise your name forever. Father, we ask that as we go from this place, Lord, the peace that you've given to us, help us to be that channel of peace to others. As you have saved us, help us now to go out into this broken world to bring peace, the peace of God, the peace of Christ as you've given it to us. Empower us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Let's again just give a clap offering to the Lord.